Hi, my name is Barry Sterling Mitchell. I produce the Sterling Net Point Power Rankings and the Bias Plus Reports. And this is Ben and Barry on football. Hello out there. This is Ben Dickerson. I'm your co-host. Well, folks, the NFL season is upon us. Training camps have opened. Guys are reporting. There's still a lot of movement. Contracts being signed. Teams trying to sign their rookie picks especially the high draft picks. They're trying to get that done. So uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to continue on with what we've been doing as far as um, position groups are concerned. And today we're going to do the tight end. So I'm excited to get started. The tight end position has evolved. Um, the, the, what do they call them now? Jacked up wide receivers <laughs> in some cases. <laughs> In some cases, yes. Uh, well, okay. It goes along with the whole premise. It's not really a premise that the NFL is a passing game now. You know, every team, if you, if you don't have a good passing game, you're going to be in trouble. Obviously, we go back all the time to talk about in order to win a Super Bowl, you got to have a good run game and a good defense. But it's a passing league. It's a quarterback-driven league. There's no doubt about that. So... Uh, the emergence of more athletic uh, and, and wide receiver type tight ends is now in play. You know, it's funny. I, I listened to you say it's a passing league and, and that's kind of accepted, um, accepted truisms as a, you know, and you hear it all the time. The thing that's interesting about football is, is it's kind of a proxy for war. And in any war, in the historic wars, now the current wars may be a little different, but the old wars, as you went through World War I, for example, World War II, you had to have a ground game and an air game. Absolutely. <laughs> you Absolutely. Know, um, balance to some degree, the ability to do both of them. So when you say it's a passing league, I think it's interesting that we're talking about tight ends because they bridge the run game and the pass game because these guys are getting rated by pro football focus on their contribution to the run as well as the pass. So they get rated on both sides of that. You know what I mean? So that, that makes true. tight ends even, even more interesting. And I know as a former linebacker, who dealing with guys who were tight end size, you know, those are some great matchups between the great linebackers and the great tight ends and things of that nature. So um, I'm looking forward to this. For our radio audience, um, our show runs on Fridays from 6 to 7.30 at WJRL953.com. Remember, uh, for our YouTube audience, to click the subscribe button and the notification button so you'll know when we put out our weekly show, especially as we're getting into the actual season. And again, you can find our podcasts on Apple and Spotify and Anchor Podcasts. We are on all of the social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and uh, also YouTube, which is where this video is going, Benny. So let's get ready to kick this thing off and talk about the tight ends in the NFL as ranked, but not necessarily agreeing to the rankings <laughs> as ranked by Pro Football Focus. Let's go. Okay. Yes. Let me remind everyone. These are rankings based on Pro Football Focus. I don't have a big argument with it, but it is not a list that I would 100% agree with, but that's okay. Uh, we have information on our guys. Also, let me tell you, everybody before we start, if you remember when we did offensive lines and defensive lines and, and, and running backs and quarterbacks previously, we talked about the room. We talked about the entire unit. <clears throat> it's going to be a little bit different. And I'll tell you that because most of the tight ends that will be mentioned are the number one guy and, and, and play a, a full-time number one role. 
So their backup barely plays, if at all, okay? But you will find also that there are one, two, three, four, five teams who have more than one guy that made the top 32. So this is not a list of every tight end on all 32 teams. This is the top 32. And in fact, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers have three tight ends that made the top 32, just to let you know in case you hear uh, team names, multiple team names. So let's get started. And we're going to start with number 32 and work our way up. And the first guy, guy is a Tampa Bay Buccaneer, and that's Cameron Brait. Cameron Brait of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers um, actually did his, some of his best work coming down the stretch like around from week 12 on last season and through the playoffs. Obviously, a team that has three tight ends that could all be starters uh, has to kind of pick and choose and weigh and look at situations and, and take into account uh, possible injuries. So they're not going to be heavily, heavily targeted. But uh, Cameron Braid has proven that he's a shorthanded, good route running tight end. Uh, last year, he had uh, 28 receptions on 34 targets. So he's pretty efficient. It was 282 yards and he had two touchdowns. But like I said, he did most of his work coming down the stretch and into the playoffs and through the playoffs and in the Super Bowl. So obviously played a big part for the Buccaneers. All right. You know, um, Cameron Braid has a very interesting contract. I'm going to look at some of the contract things. Ben has kind of talked about the player as a player. Um, when I look at Cameron uh, Braid's contract, number one, he's 30 years old. Um, he has a contract that looks as if it extends through 2025, except that it's been voided for 2024 and 2025. He has a total cap hit over from July 20, excuse me, from 2021 to 2025 of 17 million. So his base salary, 2021, 1 million, 2022, 6.5, and 2023, 7.5. Then you've got some prorated bonuses and things of that nature added on. So he's a well-paid um tight end, but he's going to have a, a, a cap hit of uh, 6.5 million and 7.5 million in 2022 and 2023, which, re which represents 3.5% of the total cap. My thought when I see the cap go from 1 million in 2021 to 6.5 million in 2022, 7.5 in 2023, is he's going to have to perform or he's not going to be there. You know, they're going to find a way to either restructure that contract or restructure him. So it's going to be interesting to see. And with, with them having three tight ends, we'll see what the other ones are making in comparison. Uh, if they emerge, he might become a little more uh, expendable. <laughs> well, my thought process on that is uh, everything you said is absolutely true. But and not to give away anything, but let's real quick name the other two guys you have oj howard who's a young guy who sustained some injuries over the last couple seasons and you have rob gronkowski who's been around been there done that getting up in age and has taken a lot of abuse on his body i would venture to guess that they're willing to pay cameron break at 30 because i don't see gronkowski maybe staying around another two years so that's probably their thought process right now. O.J. Howard is the future. Cameron Brait is the present. And Gronk is not done yet. So that's where they are right now. But two years from now, that Brait contract might be a bargain. Well, it's been voided for 2024 and 2025. So, you know, this is one of the few contracts that I've seen with that extended that far out and then were voided. So we'll have to see how that works out. Who's up next? Up next at number 31, we have Blake Jarwin of the Dallas Cowboys. Now I'm not going to say a whole lot about Blake Jarwin. In fact, I'm not even going to give you any stats because last year he went out with a torn ACL and barely played if he played at all. 
But when they got Blake Jarman, Jarwin, he had a decent 20, 2019 season, and they were expecting him to take over for Jason Witten. That was the plan. So now that he's back, hopefully healthy, and going into training camp this year, that wish is still out there, that he takes over and gets the job done now that Jason Witten is gone. He is the new Jason Witten to the Dallas Cowboys, and that's what they're expecting out of him. Wow. Wow. Um, you know, it's interesting as I look at some of this contract information, um, how many of these tight ends that are in this top list were undrafted free agents? Lots of them. <laughs> Probably the biggest brotherhood. If there's one area common between all of them. It's that. Now, um, as I look at Blake Jarwin's contract information here, um, uh, it runs through 2023. He has a total cap number of 21.2 million. Um, again, his base salary goes up from 2.25 uh, in 2020, 3.5, 2021, 4.5 and 5.5. Um, the bonuses were about a million dollars a piece and the guarantees were given pretty much uh, last year and this year. So um, his hit is a little bit less. His cap percentage only hits 3% in 2022. So uh, interestingly, again, 15, 17, or excuse me, 15 to $21 million for an undrafted free agent. That's pretty good. <laughs> I mean, if, you, if you're going to be undrafted, man, if you can make money like that, that's pretty good. So fantastic. Anything else on, on this gentleman? No, sir. I'm ready to move on to number 30. Number 30. Who we got? Adam Troutman of the New Orleans Saints. Now, this is interesting. And you may, as we go along here, start thinking to yourself, sounds like some of these guys have made it to this list on potential. And I would say that there's a good, op there's a good chance that that's, that's part of it. If there is such a guy, that would be Adam Troutman. Here's the good thing about Adam Tra Troutman. He's an excellent run blocker. So that goes a long way, especially for a team like the New Orleans Saints. He only caught 15 passes last season, but he only got 16 targets. <laughs> Extremely efficient, okay? It was only 171 yards. He did score one touchdown. So the fact that he's an excellent uh, uh, run blocker, he has the size to be a tight end uh, red zone threat, and the current situation with the New Orleans Saints with Michael Thomas being injured and the uh, number one receiver situation a bit in turmoil. That means a heavier workload for uh, Alvin Kamara, and it also probably means a heavier receiving workload for Troutman. So we'll see if he comes through there expecting to. You know, this that sounds like an interesting ex, uh, person for me to look at when we, we had our little conversation about pro football focuses. Um, was it yards per route run that we talked about? So, you know, that'll be interesting to see with, with the amount of targets that he has and the efficiencies, you know, that he had, uh, you know, there. So we'll look at that target. Now, as I look at this gentleman, uh, let me see, Mr. Troutman here. All right. Again, part of that undrafted free agent brotherhood <laughs> that's in the top 32, according to Pro Football Focus. Now, this gentleman is a bargain. Uh, he has a total uh, cap hit of 4.3 million, um, base salary of 3.4 million. So he's less, he's about 0.6% of the cap. So they're getting, you know, they, I guess he's still on his rookie contract. <clears throat> and uh, so they're get, getting good value out, 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 of, uh, out of Mr. Uh, Troutman. So we'll have to see how that works out for him. 
Uh, again, undrafted free agent, 6'6", 253. Um, so that, that's a good deal. All right, who we have next? And, and let's remember about Troutman. They had Jared Cook last year. He was the number one tight end. Jared Cook is now gone. So Troutman steps into that position. He's already a proven run blocker, and he's already proven that he's got the size and the hands to be a real threat. So I'm expecting him to have a, a big season. All right. All right, Mr. Troutman. And we, right. we don't know who's going to be throwing to him yet, whether it's going to be Jameis. Uh, we're not even going to get into that. <laughs> <laughs> I, they can put me back there. I'll find him. <laughs> I'll find him and Kamara. And I'll, Kamara. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll throw it to him underhand. Uh, here we go. Number 29 we're at. Uh, and we see here Jordan Akins of the te uh, Houston Texans. Now, obviously, everybody knows the mess right now that is the Houston Texans. Um, they've got all kinds of issues. Uh, we don't even want to get into the Deshaun Watson thing. But they've lost some really good playmakers, which can be looked at as a bad thing. But when you're the up and coming guy, it can be looked at as a positive for you. So Akins is going to get a big chance. Now, he made really big strides last year, which was his third year uh, on the team. Uh, and in fact, in 2019, he was pretty bad. But last year, he actually had 37 catches on 49 targets for 403 yards, and he did score one touchdown. So he made somewhat of an impact, but he was so much better last season than he was in 2019, where he was barely used, that the future looks bright for him. And obviously, with the situation that the Houston Texans are going through, um, they're really dependent on him a lot. Well, uh, they're getting him cheap. He has a total uh, cap number over a 2018 to 2021 period. This is his, his last year. So the, he's only hitting him up for $2.3 million on the cap uh, in 2021. And then he's, uh, he'll be a, a free agent. So, uh, yeah, this is, this is a shot. And, again, like you said, so much going on there. Um, but – it's it's interesting. I actually heard them uh, interview the coach at camp, you know, and uh, I mean, what what a position to be in as a as a rookie head coach. This guy's got a lot of experience coaching, but this is his first head coaching job. So um, good luck with that. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Number 28. 28. Yes. Anthony Ferkser. Anthony Ferkser, remember that name. He plays for the Tennessee Titans. Now, this guy's got a big opportunity coming up, and he's shown that he's pretty efficient. Even though last year he played behind Johnu Smith for the Titans, but Johnu Smith has now gone off to the New England Patriots, which makes Ferkser the number one tight end on the Titans. Last year, he got 50 targets. Not bad for a part-time player. He made 39 catches, 387 yards, and one touchdown. The limited role is over. The job is yours. Let's see what he does with it. All righty there. So we got Ferkser. Um, and as I looked up Ferkser here, uh, he has three seasons under his belt. That's what it says. He has a 2021 contract for $1.75 million. He has a cap hit of $3 million because he got some bonus money, $1.2 plus. So this is it. You know, he's going to be he's been going to be looking for a new contract next year. So this is a big opportunity. Right on time. He gets the starting spot right on time. Yeah, absolutely. You get a chance to shine there, man. Fantastic. Fantastic. That's Mr. Anthony Ferser, tight end. Uh, all right, who's up next? Up next, number 27. This is a name that a lot of people should be familiar with, especially if you play fantasy. Hayden Hurst. Hayden Hurst is with the Atlanta Falcons. And here's another team that's got some things going on. Got an aging 
Uh, obviously, Pro Bowl, uh, perennial Pro Bowl quarterback, but he is aging. They just lo lost Julio Jones. And I believe it was just reported that Calvin Ridley, who will now be the number one wide receiver on that team, is a little bit nicked up in training camp too. So Hayden Hurst is going to be dependent on quite a bit. But he's a proven commodity. Um, this, in fact, will be the first time being a primary target at tight end for Hayden Hurst. He played for the Baltimore Ravens and played behind Mark Andrews. And he also played with the Falcons behind Austin Hooper. But Austin Hooper's now gone off to the Cleveland Browns. So Hayden Hurst gets his first chance to be the number one guy last season. He was pretty heavily targeted. He had 85 targets. He caught 56 passes. He did score six touchdowns. So he was a big help to the Falcons in that respect. Uh, and he gained 571 yards. So all along, even when he was playing alongside other tight ends, he was able to make himself known as far as statistically and, and helping them win games. Uh, now he's got the number one spot off to himself. So we'll see if he's going to be able to excel. Also, he's in a situation where he probably will be leaned on a little, more, a little bit more heavily than he was in the past. So again, another opportunity for a guy to have a big season. Well, he's gotten paid in this time. His total contract value shows up at over $11 million. Uh, He had 10.4 guarantee, but it looks as if his... Uh, 2021 is the end of his contract, and he's coming up on that. It's not a big number uh, for 2021, cap number of under $2 million. So, you know, he's going to – if he can excel, he'll be a great value for them, and then he'll have an opportunity to go on and potentially make some, some nice money there. So, all right, there we have Hayden Hurst from the Atlanta Falcons. Who's up next? Up next, number 26 is Irv Smith of the Minnesota Vikings. Irv Smith is a guy just like Hayden Hurst. He's got his first opportunity to be the main dude. He's been playing with the Vikings alongside and sometimes behind Kyle Rudolph. But Kyle Rudolph has now moved on to the New York Giants. He's going to have a very big role there. Uh, they like to use the tight end. Obviously, Kyle Rudolph had a nice or had a bunch of nice seasons playing for the Vikings, and now Irv Smith takes over there. Uh, last season, he was targeted 41 times, came up with 30 catches, 365 yards, and he scored five touchdowns. So he is an obvious red zone target. That's big for them. Uh, along with Justin Jefferson, he's going to be a big part of their passing game. And uh, Kirk Cousins will be looking for him quite a bit. Yeah, good idea, good idea. And for the organization, they have him signed through 2022. A uh, little over a million per year from 2021 to 2022. He's still a pretty young guy, 24 years old. So he's not hurting them in the, in the money right now. He's got a contract through 2022. So he's there and he'll have an opportunity. Uh, fantastic, fantastic. All right, who's up next? Up next, number 25 is Eric Ebron. Eric Ebron is another name that should be familiar to a lot of fans out there. And also fantasy players should know about Eric Ebron. He plays for the Pittsburgh Steelers now. Now in the past, he has played for the Lions and he has played for the Indianapolis Colts before signing with Pittsburgh. Now he is a proven player. He's proven he can make plays. He's also proven that he is a red zone threat. The problem for Eric Ebron is dropping passes. He dropped seven passes last season. He's got 40 career drops. So the fact that he's even on this list lets you know what kind of an athlete this guy is and, and the stuff that he's done in the past because 40 career drops in a, what, four or five season career? That seems like a lot. But when he gets the ball in his hands, He's a problem. 56 catches on 85 targets last year, 558 yards, and he also scored five touchdowns. And that's for a Pittsburgh Steelers offense that struggled a bit coming down at the end of the season last year. So, again, 
even though Pittsburgh has a really nice receiving core, they're going to lean on Eric Ebron a lot, probably mostly in the red zone area. He has another one of those contracts. His contract years run 2020 through 2025, but 2022 to 2025 is now void. His total cap number hit was 12 million, um, but for 2021 itself, it looks like 4.5 million and then 2022. Even though the contract has been voided, it's still 3.9 million. So he has an interesting contract um, and when you said that the, about the drops, you know, I look up here and you say drops and I see void. I'm like, I wonder if there's a connection. <laughs> I don't know, but I think that's, to me, that's problematic. But what he does produce, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's a weird situation, but it also could be part of the reason why he's on his third, uh, third team. You know, um, a sure-handed tight end is one thing to have a tight end. It's another thing to have a sure-handed tight end. Because right. many times, that's the crucial situation. I know, you know, that's what makes Kittle Kittle. You know, that's, and, and you know, that's what makes Kelsey Kelsey. But uh, this guy's got all the, the, the uh, skills, size, speed. He has all of that stuff. Uh, but you got to have sticky hands. So we'll see how that works out for him. Who's up next? Okay, up next, number 24 is Jack Doyle of the Indianapolis Colts. Jack Doyle played along Eric Ebron, uh, alongside Eric Ebron for a few years. Now the job is his. I personally, and this is, <laughs> I don't have a lot to say about Jack Doyle. He's a big guy. He's pretty sure-handed. But in the words of Pro Football Focus, he is steady but unexciting. <laughs> Last year, he's only targeted 33 times, and this is after Ebron is gone. Only targeted 33 times. He did catch 23 of those passes. But it was for a mere 251 yards. He did score three touchdowns. So besides being a red zone target and maybe helping to move the sticks from time to time, Eric Ebron's best attributes is run blocking. Not a big time threat <laughs> in the receiving category. Of all of the guys that we've talked about so far, 32 through, what number is this one? He's 24. To 24. Eric, e, I mean, excuse me, Jack Doyle. Over his total contract has the biggest cap number, 26.799, basically 26.8 million. Uh, he's got a contract that ran from 2019 through 2022, uh, where he's making in 2021, uh, looks like he has a total cap hit of 5.69, 5.7 million. So he's making he's he's hitting them up for five point seven million in twenty twenty one and six point two in twenty twenty two. So you might not be that excited about him, <laughs> but he's getting paid well. <laughs> That's okay. That does, has nothing to do with my excitement. <laughs> I only care about production. Somebody got excited at <laughs> contract signing time. Somebody got yeah, excited. he did. Oh no, whoever paid them, they they the one, they're the ones who get yeah, they excited. got overexcited. <laughs> yeah. okay. But to be fair, Ebron is gone. The job is his. He has a chance to have a great season. We'll see. All right, here we go. Back to the Buccaneers, right? Back to the Buccaneers at number 23, OJ Howard. Yeah, you heard of OJ Howard. But have you seen O.J. Howard? O.J. Howard has had some really bad injury plague seasons. Uh, he was a first round pick in 2017. He's shown flashes of actual brilliance, but he suffered so many various injuries in every season except for 2019. Um, it, it's, it's, it's really a shame because when you see the guy actually on the field and playing, 
He's amazing to watch. Size, speed, route running ability, hands. He seems to have it all now. 2019, <laughs> excuse me? No, just go ahead. Oh, I thought you said something. In 2019, when he actually played about 14 games, almost the entire season, he had 34 catches for 459 yards and one touchdown. Last season, he only had 11 catches on 18 targets for 146 yards, and he scored two touchdowns. But he did that in four games. This guy's explosive, okay? He just has to stay healthy. Believe me, we've already talked about Cameron Brate. Everybody knows we're going to talk about Gronk. So you got a three-headed tight end monster down there in Tampa Bay. But O.J. Howard is the guy they're counting on to carry the mantle for them into the future. Brate's going to hold it up now. Gronk might have another season or two left in it. So O.J. Howard has to get himself together physically, stay on the field, and then you'll see – some real good you, what you'll see is you'll see him flying up the charts on rankings like this according to his contract ben the future is now it runs through 2021 the bulk of his base salary gets paid this year at, uh, over six million dollars over the 2017 to 2021 period uh he has a total cap number of 17.1 million so he's been paid well during that time that you're saying he's really hasn't been on the field. Um, as soon as you said it, I'm sorry. I have songs always pop into my head. Remember, have you seen her? <laughs> have you seen him? Yeah. <laughs> that's what you said. Have you seen him? You know, your best, ability, your best ability is availability. And, you know, I believe that if he stays healthy, he will earn every penny of his contract. I believe in this guy as an athlete and as a tight end. But there's only so long a team is going to go paying you on potential that you never actually show. So the structure know. of his contract actually goes well with the fact that he he's compared to the current year that he wasn't there much because 2017 he had he made four hundred sixty five thousand two hundred twenty eighteen nine hundred sixty nine thousand. He didn't get to the million status until 2019 at one point four and 2020 one point nine. 2021, six million dollars. <laughs> so he's getting paid this year. That availability is really going to be scrutinized closely. Yeah, but remember when we were talking about the receivers? Remember what I told you? This guy was a first round pick. Teams are not quick to call a first round pick a bust. They will do whatever they have to do to make a first round pick work. The good thing for O.J. Howard is when he's been on the field, he's been tremendous. So this isn't like we're sitting around waiting for Henry Ruggs to catch 50 balls in a season. <laughs> O.J. Howard can get it done. He just has to stay healthy. That's it. Now, you didn't have to do a shot at Ruggs like that. <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> no, you didn't. <laughs> Who's up next? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, Henry Ruggs. Erase that and insert John Ross. <laughs> You're the other one. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Excuse me out there, folks. Number 22. We, we're getting up there now. These guys from 22 and number 20 on up are all good playmakers. Number 22, Mo Alley Cox, Indianapolis Colts. I made an error. I said before we started that there were a few teams that had more than one guy to make this list. The Colts are one of those teams. And Mo Alley Cox is rated higher than Jack Doyle. Jack Doyle, Mr. Steady but Unexciting, guess what? You're going to have to work really hard to get them targets in those receptions and that yardage up because Mo Alley Cox looks like he's going to be the main guy there. Um, his grades were affected in the past because they had the three-man rotation going on when they had Ebron. Uh, but he's a very efficient receiver and a far better than average run blocker. So, you know, if he's excelling at both, that's a big push for him. Uh, last year he caught 30, 31 passes 
on 36 targets. He had 394 yards and two touchdowns. So if you compare that with Jack Doyle, it's very comparable. Obviously, he got like 100 more yards, uh, one less touchdown, but his targets are almost exactly the same. He just did a little bit more with his targets. So I would say that Mo Ali Cox deserves to be the number one tight end uh, in Indianapolis. If they go with two tight end sets, they do have Jack Doyle and they can bring Jack Doyle in to spell him when they need to. We'll see how it goes, but I like Mo Ali Cox. Jack Doyle, we talked about his contract to having a total value of over $26.8 million, getting paid uh, somewhere in the area of $5.7 million this year. And then you look at Mo Ali Cox, he's got a one-year contract for $3.38 million. That's it. So very interesting. I think they signed him away from the Jets or somebody in free agency a year or two ago. So he might be on a prove it deal. Um, but the bottom line is last season he was better, you know? So you, you may see him sign for uh, a sign a new contract. It all depends on how it goes this year, but beware of guys that are on their contract year. That's usually when you see dudes blow up when they know, if I show what I can do this year and I have a good season, I can sign that multi-year security blanket contract that everybody's looking for. So, yeah, look out for Mo Alley Cox. I think it's going to be a big season for him. Interesting. Um, and we'll talk about uh, Aaron Rodgers later. Um, but Aaron Rodgers said, as he was explaining that he wanted to be more of a part of that, you know, conversation when you're talking about, you know, guys' contracts and who you're going to let go and who you're going to bring. And he literally said what you just said. Oh, well, we know that in a contract year. And I don't have to worry about that guy being motivated because he's in a contract year. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> so he literally said that in his, um, you know, I used to think that that was one of those unsaid realities and you know, we all knew it but nobody actually said it you're going to try harder in your contract year you know what i mean nobody actually said it Aaron just came out <laughs> threw it right out there <laughs> yeah I, i've been on that train for a long time you know if people laugh and they're oh you play fantasy football guess what if i'm in a draft and i have to pick a receiver or a running back or whoever a skill position player and i can't make up my mind between this guy and that guy I look at their contracts and if a guy's on his contract year, I take him. <laughs> I might say you go that deep for fantasy. Yes, I do. That's why I win. Fantasy alert, fantasy alert. <laughs> contract year, consider it. Throw that into the mix when you're trying to make a decision. Ah, uh, man, you look at these kind it's amazing how, you know, especially in the rankings, when you see some of these guys higher in the rankings that are getting paid much less than some of the guys that are much lower in the rankings, again, these are according to pro football focus. Uh, let me, me remind everyone again, this is Ben and Barry on football. You can find us at www.benandbarryonfootball.com. And this week we are talking about NFL tight ends as ranked by pro football focus. We just left off with one, who was that we just talked about? Mo Ali Cox. Correct. And now we're getting ready to move on to the next one. What number is this? Now we're up to number 21, and that would be Gerald Everett. Gerald Everett is now with the Seattle Seahawks. He used to play for the Los Angeles Rams. While he was with the Rams last year, he um, – played alongside Tyler Higby, so his snaps were limited. However, he did make the most of the snaps. Uh, unfortunately, we got another great athlete at the tight end position who has an issue with dropping passes. He, in fact, dropped six balls last year. But even though he dropped six balls last year, 
He was targeted 59 times. He caught 41 of them, 417 yards, and he had one touchdown. I've watched this guy play. I like his athleticism. If he can cut down on the drop passes, I think he will play a big part for Seattle at tight end. Uh, they have another guy who had, did not make this list by the name of Hollister, who I like also. But I think Everett's going to move in there and prove that he can be a number one tight end. Uh, Everett um, has a two-year deal, 2021 and 2022. Uh, had a base salary of $2 million for 2021. He got a, uh, $2 million in guarantees, so he had a cap hit of $4 million. And then in 2022, he uh, is getting a prorated bonus of $2 million. So he has a total contract of $6 million, uh, but it's just between 2021 and 2022. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how he continues to progress um, based on that salary. So he's got something coming. But it says here in 2022, the base salary was void. So he just looks like he's got some bonus money coming next year. And that kept their uh, cap number down. All right, they took the cap hit in 2021, so uh, that all eyes will be on him for sure, no doubt about it. All right, who do we have next? I am so delighted to say that this guy made it to the top 20. Number 20 is Kyle Rudolph of the New York Football Giants. Now, here's the deal. I didn't even bother to put down stats for him. But what I will say is, because of Irv Smith, guy that we talked about earlier, who Rudolph, according to Pro Football Focus, is rated higher than a younger, more productive guy, okay? Rudolph's snaps were very limited. He didn't play much at all. I think the Vikings thought that he was done. Obviously, the Giants don't think he's done. He's now with the Giants. He's teamed up with Evan Ingram who I believe can be a great tight end and Kyle Rudolph, I believe will serve as an excellent mentor and somebody that can push him a little bit. So this is all good for the giants. As far as I'm concerned, Rudolph's been around for 11 years and his biggest asset is his hands. We've been talking about guys dropping passes. Kyle Rudolph has dropped two balls in the last four years. Wow. Wow. That's an amazing stat. That's an amazing stat. Um, when I'm looking at uh, his contract information, he's got a two-year deal, 2021 and 2022. And it brings up something that I see going on a lot where they push that cap number out into the future. It's almost like buying um, on credit. You know, <laughs> some point it's going to come due. But uh, he has a $4.7 million cap hit. Uh, in 2021, which represents 2.6% of your total uh, cap. And then 2022, that goes up to 7.2 million, where it goes to 3.5 million. So that mentorship better be very valuable <laughs> if he's going to hang around, because they're going to be looking at him closely to see whether or not they want to take that $7.2 million hit in 2022. Well, you know, it's funny. Um it may be worth it to them. I think they treasure Evan Ingram so much that they're willing to bring in this guy. I, it's funny, uh, you know, watching the NBA. There's guys on certain NBA teams. And you're like, this dude is still playing, but he is so good in the locker room. And he is so good with kind of keeping things running smoothly on the team with the younger players. Uh, helping them with all the little things that maybe the assistant coaches don't have time to do. Um, it's, it's, it's just, it's vital. So if a team feels like it's worth it and the guy still has some juice left, they're going to pay him. Now, obviously he has to, you know, he has to prove himself one way or the other. I think he can still play. He obviously has short hands. There's no doubt about that. And the other thing is, guess what? Number 19 is Evan Ingram of the New York Football Giants. Pro Football <laughs> Focus has them ranked 19 and 20. How crazy is that? And you know, Evan Ingram's big two biggest problems are injuries, hello, Kyle Rudolph, and drop balls, hello, Kyle Rudolph. 
okay? Uh, last year, 102 targets for Evan Ingram. The guy has talent. I, I kind of put him in the O.J. Howard thing. Obvious talent, obvious athleticism. The drop passes are a problem, but he can fix that. But if you're not on the field, you're no help to your team. You have to stay healthy. This guy's got good seat, good size, good speed. He, he can run block. He, he basically seems to have it all. He just has to stay on the field. Now, last year, he had 11 drop passes. That's unacceptable to me as a Giants fan, okay? But he was targeted 102 times. That's wide receiver targets. He caught 63 balls. There's a lot of wide receivers that didn't get that many targets or catch that many passes. He only scored one touchdown. That's a problem. I would like him to be a bigger threat in the red zone. But other than that, this guy's got it all. All he has to do is stay on the field and get his hands right. And he shoots up these rankings. Interestingly, um, he came in contract year starting out in 2017, uh, making about $465,000, actually $1.9 million because he had a, a bonus of $1.4 million. So when you look at 2017 through current 2021, and his contract apparently uh, ends at 2021, and you got that four, what, one, two, three, four, five-year rookie deal maybe? Contract uh, year. Contract year, yes. <laughs> Not just a contract year, but remember I said the NFL likes to push those those uh, cap hits out into the future. Mm -hmm. his, his first year cap hit was 1.9 million. His 2021 cap hit is going to be 6 million. Okay. So all eyes will be on him. You got uh, Evan Ingram and Kyle Rudolph, a uh, seasoned and talented group of, uh, of tight ends there. It'll be interesting to see what Danny Dimes can do uh, with that. So, all right, there you go, Mr. Giants, Mr. New York football Giants. Who's up next? Up next, the name that we heard earlier in reference to somebody else, number 18, Tyler Higby. Tyler Higby of the Los Angeles Rams. Obviously, um, a high-powered offense in the past and a high-powered offense looking toward the future. Now that they have Matt Stafford, uh, Tyler Higby is due for a good year. Now he had a red hot finish to the 20, 2019 season with 43 catches and 522 yards in only five games. Let me repeat that. This guy had 43 receptions for 522 yards in five games coming down the stretch in 2019. And last year, he comes back down to earth. I don't know what happened, okay? 44 catches, 59 targets, 521. He did catch five touchdowns, so he is a magnet in the red zone. Lots of potential here. Big chance to put it all together. Rams are counting on him to be a number one tight end. Uh, folk Pro Football Focus has him ranked at number 18, so they believe in him too. Uh, I actually like Tyler Higby. I don't think they use him enough, but uh, – Gerald Everett, who was with the Rams, is now gone. So there's nobody there to hog any of his targets. Let's see what he can do. Tyler Higby is 28 years old. He has a contract that runs through 2023. Total contract uh, cap number from 2019 to 2023 is $32 million. So as we just talked about how they pushed that they like to push that cap out into the future. Um, his 2019 cap it was 1.7, 2020 was 9 million. That's 4.5% of the cap last year. And 4% this year is this cap hit in 2021 is gonna be 7.4 plus uh, million dollars. So he's got substantial cap numbers for 2021, 2022, 2023, as 2022 and 23, both are around 6.8 million. Again, you're at around 3% of the total cap. So this gentleman, good money, $32 million total contract. 
you say prove it? Absolutely. Absolutely. His production, his costs are going up, but his production is going down. I guess that's what it looks like. Well, it, it has gone down, but the potential that he showed at the end of the season previous to last year tells you what the guy can do. So, again, we talked about ranking guys on potential. Obviously, that's that's a part of the whole you know calculation, but it's basically based on true production. So he's shown what he can do in a uh, small sample size. And although he didn't come through uh, the way they expected him to, I'm sure, last year, I don't say it's all his fault. Obviously, he was targeted. Obviously, he caught balls. I just don't think he was used as much as he could have been. But we'll see what happens this season. Matthew Stafford is there now. And uh, from what I know, Matthew Stafford likes to go to the tight end. So we'll see what happens. That could be an interesting combo, Matthew Stafford, you know, uh, with that new quarterback going there. And uh, Tyler Higby might find a, some comfort uh, with a nice big uh, tight end like that. And you say he likes, quarter, likes tight ends. So, um, all right, let's go with what's next. Number, Who do we 17, have? number 17, we're talking about Austin Hooper, another guy whose name was mentioned previously, Austin Hooper was playing alongside Hayden Hurst with the Atlanta Falcons. He is now a Cleveland Brown. So he gets to go from a team that's kind of on the downside to a team that is right now on the rise, and that's the Cleveland Browns. Now, uh, I mentioned earlier, as I've done before, that I don't necessarily agree with Pro Football Focus's rankings this is a guy that I probably would have ranked lower. He's not a great athlete. He is a good route runner. He has a knack for finding holes in zone defenses. But when he's in coverage, meaning a linebacker's playing him straight up or a safety or, or, or a slot corner, he has a little trouble getting open. But he does have reliable hands, and he can – find his way through his own. Um, so that makes him a reliable guy. Uh, 46 catches on 65 targets. Not super exciting, but pretty efficient. Uh, 435 yards. He did score four touchdowns. So that's a big plus. Uh, if you get four, five, six, seven touchdowns out of your tight end, that means uh, you're a red zone problem. And that's a good thing. So Kudos to Austin Hooper. Let's see how he does as the Cleveland offense and Baker Mayfield mature even more. Oh, yeah. And Odell Beckham is back, too. That could be an issue. Ben, he has a contract that runs from 2020 through 2024. Over that period of time, he has a total cap number. I want you to guess it. I'm not going to guess his cap number. Total contract. You have any idea what his total contract, huh? Runs from 2020 to 2024. Yep. His total cap hit, I will say, is $8 million. His, over, that, over that time period. Yes. Cap number total, $42 million. What? <laughs> no, that can't be right. Hey, look, you know, over the cap.com, Again, they pushed out a lot of the cap number into the future. 2022-2023, he's 9.5 million base salary for those two years alone. Um, his total base salary over that time period, 2020 to 2024, is 25 million. Then he has a prorated bonus, 17 million, guarantees of six, totaling 42. So he, he's expensive. He's going to have to do, he's going to have to really show it. Now, again, 2021, 4.5 million. He has an $8.2 million cap hit, 3.9% of the cap in 2021, almost 4%. So you can see that the cost is going up. I mean, let's face it. Pro Football Focus has him ranked as at, at number 17. He's not a scrub. The guy is reliable and he's been around. He's a proven commodity. He just is... Again, here we go. Steady but unexciting. 
You know what I mean? But he fits well with the Cleveland Browns. If you, if you look at their receiver core and you look at how Baker Mayfield has been progressing at quarterback, and then you plug in a guy like him who can find his way around his own defense, like I said, he may have trouble when he's actually in coverage, but when you got a receiver core like they have with Landry and, and Beckham and uh, uh, the other guy's name escapes me right off. They have Njoku still right. there. And Njoku? Yeah, tight end. Njoku is a tight end, isn't he? Yeah. Let me put it to you this way. He ain't on this list. <laughs> okay? That's probably why Hooper's getting paid. And Njoku's a bust, bro. That's crazy, man. I thought Njoku was going to be, like, serious. So did I. But as of this moment, Njoku is a bust. I'm that not saying blows my mind. Over. Yeah, I'm not saying really? his career is over, but he's nowhere near the top 32 at the top 32 at his position. Holy nowhere. mackerel. Holy yeah, mackerel. But again, in, in Austin Hooper's defense, he is not a scrub. I'm sure the Cleveland Browns feel like He's playing a vital part, playing his role in their offense, and they're paying him accordingly. I would I would venture to guess, though, that there will be some restructuring later on down the line. Yeah, I would think so, too. <laughs> I think there's going to be some major restructuring. Keep an eye on that contract. Okay, man. Where are we at? Number 16. Oh, we're getting up there. Halfway baby. through. Yeah. All right, top half. We're in the... Next, almost in the top half, right? Yes, sir. Jared Cook. Jared Cook, famous for being the tight end for the New Orleans Saints, is now with the L.A. Chargers. Okay? He's with the L.A. Chargers. So he goes from a career being with Drew Brees to hooking up with one of the hottest young quarterbacks out there right now, Justin Herbert. Good for him. This guy's been around for a little while. He's 34 years old, but he can still get deep. That's the big deal for Jared Cook. Um, over the last two seasons with uh, the Saints and obviously last uh, the last three seasons, one with the Saints, the last two with the Raiders, uh, he's averaged 14.2 yards per reception. If you look at the per reception numbers, that we talked about or haven't talked about. But if you go back and look at some of these receivers and look at their per reception numbers, you will find uh, that that is more than any other tight end in the league with 100 catches or more over that time period, which is the last three years. That's big, okay? You don't normally get tight ends, especially at 34, yard, uh, 34 years old, that have that much impact down the field. Um, Last year, he had uh, 59 targets, caught 37 balls, 504 yards. Eh, guess what? Seven touchdowns. And they weren't all red zone strikes. This guy still has a lot of juice left in him for 34, being 34 years old. I think Jared Cook will thrive with the Chargers and Justin Herbert. If he thrives, then they'll have to give him another contract because they only gave him a one-year deal. He's making four and a half million. Uh, in 2021 so he'll have an opportunity uh, if he thrives to to uh, maybe get some extension on that contract even though he is 30, 34 years old um sorry about that all right Je man that that was interesting that was interesting because <laughs> when you said what did you say his average reception was 14.2 yards per reception I kept thinking to myself, is that about how far Drew could throw the ball? <laughs> oh, come on, man. The guy's retired. Give him a break. <laughs> you're relentless. Hey, look, you're bad as, and not as bad as, well, I can't really compare rugs in them because that's, that's a whole other Exactly. <laughs> Don't even try it. Well, hey, you know, I got to I got to give Drew Brees a little bit of work, man. I was on him early. I was one of those early doubters. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Okay, we're okay. Here we are officially in the top half. I'm gonna get this guy out the way right away. 
I don't want to talk a whole lot about him because he might be a secret weapon on some of my fantasy teams. This <laughs> won't be much of a secret now since I just put it out there. But at number 15, Robert Tunyon. And I remember how to pronounce his name because Tunyon rhymes with onion. And that's how I remember because I, th I thought it was Tonyan for a long time until I heard one of the commentators say it. Robert Tunyon plays for the Green Bay Packers. Now, let me get this said real quick. This is a guy who catches a lot of balls, has really good hands, but seldom breaks tackles, a la Zach Ertz for you Eagle fans out there. However, he plays with Aaron Rodgers, so who cares, okay? 52 catches on 58 targets. Efficiency, bro. 586 yards, and he caught 11 touchdowns last year. So you got Aaron Rodgers, you got Devontae Adams, and the next guy in line was not Valdez Scantling. It might have been Lazard if he had stayed healthy. It ended up being Robert Tunyon. Watch this guy. He will be climbing the rankings also. Robert Tunyon. You know, <laughs> it just takes me back to our debate about Aaron Rodgers um, wanting to be more involved in personnel and yet being the number one offense in the NFL uh, with a bunch of guys that, as you would say, someone named me two or three of those guys <laughs> and nobody could. So they're an unknown group, um, but now they're turning into secret weapons on the Dickerson fantasy list. Such I, just discovered him, I just discovered him last season and, and he emerged out of necessity. I mean, Aaron Rodgers could, could throw to Bubita if he had to. OK, so, <laughs> you know, he can make anybody great if they really want it. Some of those guys on that team haven't really won it. Equinemius St. Brown and and Valdez Scantling, they shown flashes, but none of them has stepped up. Lazard stepped up, but then he got injured. So between Devontae Adams and Tunyon, this guy came up with an, and Aaron Jones. They came up with the number one offense, basically feeding the ball to three people. That's that's insane. Well, he has a very interesting contract. He has a contract that shows year 2021 through 2025. But 2022 to 2025 has been voided. Total cap number over that period is $3.3 million. 2021, he's going to make, a, he has a total cap number of $1.5 million, although his Debt money is $2.349 million. But in any event, they're getting them on the cheap. <laughs> so they're getting a lot of value out of your uh, secret weapon. And maybe that'll be the same mistake that your fantasy opposition will. They'll just overlook this guy because, uh, you know, they don't, they don't, they miss that value. But he's providing a lot of value for the amount of money that they're paying him. He absolutely is. And, and he'll be a candidate for uh, an upgrade, I think in another year or two. Um, definitely a candidate for signing an extension or something within the next two years. I really believe in this guy. And the next guy coming up, I also believe in. He's been around for a little while and hasn't made a lot of noise, but sure made a lot of noise last year. That's number 14. That would be Logan Thomas of the Logan Thomas of the Washington football team. Uh, 2020 was by far his best season so far of his career. Um, the guy, not only was it his best season, the guy was on the field constantly. He actually played a thousand snaps, over a thousand snaps, which was tops in the league for any tight end. He had wow. 72 receptions on 105 targets, he was heavily targeted, heavily used, was heavily productive. Again, we're up to number 14 now, and we're talking about a guy that has wide receiver numbers. 105 targets, 72 receptions, 670 yards, and six touchdowns. Logan Thomas is a guy that I kind of just fell in love with 
round about mid-season or so, latched on to him on a bunch of my fantasy teams and on a couple of them, he helped carry me to fantasy championships. This guy is a really, really good player. Run blocks, speed, hands, route running ability. He's got it all. How it works out with him with the Washington football team and their issues at quarterback will remain to be seen, but he is one reliable player. And a good value. You probably didn't have to compete to get him too hard in fantasy, did you? Exactly. That's what was great about it. You gotta In fantasy, you got to have an eye for talent. You can't wait for the guy to have three good games before you grab him, especially if it's a position of need. You got to be able to see what this guy can do, recognize it, and get him on your team when he's just sitting there on the waiver wire before everybody else recognizes how good he is. The, uh, I always like listening to the fantasy people. You know, I'm the Madden guy, you're the fantasy guy. So fantasy to me is still kind of fantastic just to listen to. But uh, when they talk about this is why you want that guy, because that guy is, 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 is hurt. And that guy is out with COVID. So he's going to be the only one left. He's going to get all the targets, you know. And so they have a lot of ways of looking at fantasy, you know, opportunities. And again, you know, um, you've got some additional ways when you start to look at contract years and things like that. Speaking of contract years, guess what it is for one uh, Mr. Logan Thomas? Excellent. 2021 contract year. It is a very a nice anymore. So <laughs> say that again. I said he's not a secret anymore. So I might have well, to fight for him this year. He's also 30 years old this year. Um, in 2020, he made t- he, he was responsible for two and a half million on the cap, and 2021, 3.6 million on the cap. He has a total contract just two years, 6.1 million. Not bad. Um, and he's giving great value for what you're telling me uh, for the money that they're paying him. So, you know, it's 2021 funny. is a contract year. It'll be interesting to see what he does. It's funny. He's been around so long and has basically been in the shadows. But I attribute that to the fact that he's probably a really, really good run blocker. And the, uh, the Washington team has been running different so-called receiving tight ends in and out of there and not really giving him a chance. But as soon as he got his opportunity, he showed what he could do. The guy's a great player. All right. Now, that is a Washington football team? Yes, it is. That's the NFC East? Yes, it is. We got another NFC East team coming up next? Yes, we do, sir. Number 13, (laughs) Zach. Ertz. Oh. Remind everybody again, I do not fully agree with where all these players are ranked. I think Logan Thomas, just based on last season alone, should be ranked higher. And I believe the exact opposite for Zach Ertz. Based on last season alone, he should be ranked lower. Pro Football Focus seems to be using a lot of Zach Ertz's previous years to rank him this high. And I think that they believe he can have a bounce back season, especially if he stays with the Eagles, which it looks like he's going to. I don't know. Anyway, the guy actually needs a bounce back season in the worst way. Uh, Trade rumors, an ankle injury, none of that stuff really helped him last year. And he had a down year. Um, And he had seven previous years of really strong play. So I don't even want to talk about his numbers. Um, There's another tight end on the Eagles that has eclipsed him. Uh, If he stays on the team, they're going to need more from him, or we're going to hear more rumors of him being traded or released. Uh, If he has a bounce back year, that will actually help him because I think his days in Philadelphia are still numbered. So he's going to want to play as well as he can this year so he can get himself a nice contract somewhere else. The guy's not dead yet, but he's on the decline. You know, we'll see what happens. Listening to the network this morning, they were talking about, they were at camp talking about uh, Ertz. Did he cry at his news conference about leaving the Eagles? 
Yeah. Just, like I said, there were a lot of trade rumors and they were going on during the season. And obviously he was hearing talk radio. He's watching ESPN. He's on social media. He thought he was out the door. So when the season ended, he, he basically thought that he was going to hear about himself being traded any day. And I believe his name was floated and some teams did inquire, but it didn't happen. So he's still here. Interesting he's- that it didn't happen because, well, number one, um, this contract that I'm looking at here ranged from 2016 through, out through 2023. Uh Again, they pushed that uh, that big cap hit further out into the future. So it really kicked in in 2020 when they took a $12 million cap hit on Zach Ertz. They have another 12, almost $13 million cap hit for 2021, which represents 6.2% of their total cap. So he's getting a base salary of eight and a half million with a prorated bonus of 4.2 million in 2021. They voided 2022 and 2023 base salary wise. So he just has prorated bonuses that they're, that will be due to him. So it might be a matter of trying to unload that contract on a guy that you're saying should have been rated lower uh, and people looking at it going, yeah, Zachary's is nice. I don't know if I want to pick up 12 to $13 million in cap space. I mean, <laughs> I'm not going to say the guy was a scrub. He wasn't. He's been around, and he's been a strong player for the Eagles for all these years. But you could kind of see the decline coming. Uh, last season, it proved itself out. Um, you know, anytime a team goes public, with their uh, wishes uh, to, to get rid of somebody. I mean, they, they weren't strong about it, like, oh, my God, he stinks. We got to get rid of him real fast before he can't play at all. Um, you know, it, it, it's obvious how they feel about him, but things haven't worked out. Now, maybe it's the contract. Maybe teams are thinking about him but want to see him play better before they decide whether or not he can really help them or not. So again, as far as he's concerned, if he stays with the Eagles, he's going to have to ball out because they're not going to keep him long if, in fact, he plays out this season. Uh, I saw something on TV the other day. The head coach came on in a press conference and said he expects Zach Ertz to be on the team come week one of the season, which means absolutely nothing because they can trade him during the season. They can trade him in camp. Anything can happen. Yep. So, but but the thing is, they're entertaining offers and teams are looking. So that's the Zach Ertz story as it stands right now, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, of uh, an inclining or increasing slope for his contract and a decreasing slope for his performance. Yeah, not a good look. That's not a good look. All right. Do we have a good look for the next one? Because I see a contract worth close to $50 million. <laughs> Are you serious? Well, let's see. Number 12 is Janu Smith. Now, we talked about Anthony Ferkser way back at the bottom of the pile, getting an opportunity to be a number one tight end for the Tennessee Titans. That opportunity has come to him because – John U. Smith is no longer there. He's off to the New England Patriots. Now, John U. Smith is one of the more explosive tight ends in this league. 7.1 yards after catch is second only to George Kittle. Let me say that again. We're talking about yak, yards after catch. He has a 7.1 yards after catch average, which is second only to George Kittle. He caught 41 balls off 63 targets for 448 yards and eight touchdowns. And he was injured off and on during the season. So he did miss some games. This guy is an emerging talent. I think New England is going to pay him as the emerging talent that they believe that he is. I agree with them. 
obviously it's easy for me. It's not my money. Okay. <laughs> yeah, really. Johnny Smith is ranked by Pro Football Focus at number 12 and has a chance to break the top 10 if he comes through like everybody expects him to. John U. Smith has a 2021 contract at age 26 value at 5.6 million on the cap. 1 million base, 3.7 million bonus, 1 million roster bonus, guarantees 1 million, comes out to 5.6 in the way that they calculated. Um, How many years did he get? He has four here, 2021, two, wow. three, and four. So New now, England believes in him. Well, we're going to see how much New England believes in him after this year because his cap hit goes from 5.6 million in 2021 to 13.7 million in 2022, 14.7 in 2023, and 15.7, which means that in 2022 through 24, one guy is going to is going to take up six over six percent of the cap space. So it will be interesting. They're getting them on the cheap for 2021. But, and if he shows through, then, you know, uh, maybe he'll be worth it. But that's some big money. The, 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 the amount of cap money that's uh, being taken up has seen a steady increase as, we've, as we have moved up the pro football focus list of tight ends. So it's going to be interesting to see how much this stuff changes. But yeah, $49.8 million total contract over that four-year period with, with uh, a good portion of it in years two through four. So, 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 so what all that contract talk tells me, okay, is that the New England Patriots do in fact believe in him. They have paid him according to what they expect from him production-wise, and they will make sure that he has every opportunity to earn every penny, which means they're going to feed him. And you already got a, a, an offense that can be and has shown in the past that it can be tight end centric. And they got the guy that they wanted. And guess what? They got another one too. And we haven't even gotten to him yet. So we'll see. It's it all, all it remains is for John New Smith to play up to his potential. And I believe they'll give him every opportunity to do that. It'll be interesting. Um, you know, again, that cap number, he has guarantees in 2022 of 9 million and 2023 of 6.2. So, you know, would they would they eat that if he doesn't show through? Mm, quite possibly, but the cap number is above that 13 and 14 plus million dollars. So it's going to be interesting. John New is getting paid, man. Who's next? Who's next? Uh, he asked me who's next. Guess what? Team we haven't heard from yet, the Denver Broncos. Number 11 is Noah Fant of the Denver Broncos. This guy is a heck of an athlete. Uh, he's young, athletic, very hard to bring down after the catch. Uh, Denver's quarterback situation is probably the only thing that's holding this guy back. Uh, last year, he had 16 catches on 89 targets. A nice 673 yards. He caught three touchdowns. He was a little bit dinged up off and on during the season. But this guy has all the athletic ability you could ever ask for. I'm going to put him again with physical attributes and hands up there in the Evan Ingram, O.J. Howard kind of mix. This guy could, well, he's number 11 now. He could easily break into the top 10 spot. But a lot of that is going to depend on the uh, Denver offense, how much they use him, and how their quarterback situation plays out. Uh, no more talk about Aaron Rodgers anymore because he's back with Green Bay. So now all the Denver Bronco fans have to come back down to earth and they get up off their knees and praying for Aaron Rodgers every night and realize that it is between Drew Locke and Teddy Bridgewater right now, and that's all you got. But I still like Noah Fan. Really nice player. Especially for the money. I mean, he's got a contract. This is the term four year, 2019 to 2022, total value 12.5 plus million. Way less than the gentleman that's one 
that's behind him on the list. Uh, he's only accounting in 2021 for 1.7% of the cap and 1.9% if they keep him around for 2022. So I expect he should be there, especially if he's giving them the type of performance that you're describing, you know, for that. So that gentleman, they're, they're getting him somewhat on the cheap for what they're getting back in value. And uh, that's that's going to be uh, good to watch. So Yeah, well, if he comes through, they'll pay for him later. They'll pay for him later, yeah. Maybe he'll be in a negotiating situation if he really comes up this year and plays well. Uh, helps uh, either Teddy or Drew Locke, whoever gets that job, if not both, you know. So we shall see. All right. That's... Uh, that's your uh, and, and you got your Aaron Rodgers comment in on that also, didn't you? Hey. <laughs> I mean, that's all I've been seeing from and hearing from Denver Bronco fans is we're gonna get him, we're gonna get Aaron. We got draft picks, we got draft capital, we can do this, we can do that. Ah, save it. He ain't coming. I don't think he was coming in the first place. I said all along he was gonna show up to camp. <clears throat> I didn't know how it was going to play out, but I thought the end result would be that he would show up in camp, and he has. So there you go. There you We're go. Hitting the top ten, bro. Hitting the top ten. Top ten again. Let me remind everybody: this is Ben and Barry on football. If you have not subscribed, hit the subscriber bell and the notification thing and all of that good stuff. And always remember: you can find us at www. Ben and Barry on football and all over on social media. And this show can be caught on WJRL953.com every Friday from 6 to 7.30. Okay. Well into the top 10. Is this number nine? No, this is number 10. This is number 10. Okay, there you number go. 10, not far removed from number 12, who was Janu Smith of the New England Patriots, is Hunter Henry of the New England Patriots, okay? Hunter Henry comes over from um, the uh, Chargers to try uh, and recreate in New England the double tight end offense. They've got two really productive guys right now. Hunter Henry was on fire uh, his first two seasons in the league, but then injuries kind of slowed him down uh, over the last two seasons. But he's still uh, been a solid receiver. Uh, he's got 86 targets last year. He made 60 receptions, 613 yards, four touchdowns. Nothing to sneeze at, especially when he's been dogged with injuries along the way. He was still able to produce. If Cam Newton or Mac Jones is the quarterback for the New England Patriots, I don't care which one of them it is. Right now, I don't see how Cam can't win that job, but they're pumping Mac Jones up. And I'm not exactly sure why, but as the season gets closer or maybe a preseason game gets played, we'll probably be able to figure that out. In the meantime, Bill Belichick is going to try to make this offense as easy as he can for either one of them. And a two tight end situation where both guys are productive, both guys can run block, and both guys are really good pass receivers, I think is the best way for them to do it. Plus, it's an offense that they're used to, that their coordinator is used to calling. Um, both these guys could be pretty explosive for the Patriots. We'll have to see. Obviously, one's going to play a little better than the other, but they're both extremely capable. So there you have it, Hunter Henry. Hunter Henry and John New Smith. Based on the contract percentage of cap value, look to average about 12% of the total cap between those two tight ends. When they signed uh, Hunter Henry here, they gave him a three year deal. And for 2021, he has a $6.8 million cap hit. That's about 3%. But 2022 and 2023, He's up where John New Smith was in the $15 million range as far as cap hits are concerned. That's where you get into a 6 and 7% of the total cap space. So would you say the New England Patriots value their new tight ends? Yes, I would. 
Yes, I Holy would. Mackerel, man. You, I don't know if there's a, a more higher paid tandem in the league. You know, when you look at the two of them on average now, you know, you might have a couple big contracts with your top five guys. But number two is, you know, being so paid so close to number one is going to be very interesting. So, all right, there you go. Hunter Henry. Who's up next? So this next guy might be a little surprised to some people. Uh, personally, I think he's a little bit high, but not really. That's number nine. That's Rob Gronkowski. Yes, Gronk of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Gronk has been slowed by age and injuries, obviously, but he's fairly healthy last season. He's still dangerous. He's still productive. Uh, he's not used as heavily as he was when Brady had him in, in, in New England. But like I said, when he's on the field, he's got to be watched. He's still a factor. He still puts up numbers. The biggest deal, I think, for Gronk, staying as highly rank, ranked as he is, is obviously injuries and also O.J. Howard. If O.J. Howard stays healthy, you're going to start to see Gronk's role begin to shrink just out of normal, you know what I mean, attrition. You got an older guy who's been banged around. He's still got juice. But you got a younger guy who's shown some tremendous flashes of talent that's going to have to be fed the ball and playing time just because of who he is and the age that he is and the potential that he's shown. So OJ Howard is the biggest thing that Gronk has to look out for. But other than that, last season, even though he was a little slightly dinged up, he caught 45 passes on 75 targets, put up 623 yards, and he scored seven touchdowns. That's big. Seven tutties, as he would say. Okay? So he's still a big-time red zone target. That's Gronk. He can play that role and get away with it. Well, I always felt that Gronk was your clutch go-to guy for Brady all along, which is why Brady wanted him there, you know? That's Push come to shove, I, need, I can go to Gronk. I need a third down. I can go to Gronk. You know what I mean? Because nobody is really big enough and strong enough to really do It's a mismatch. That's the bottom line. And it, it worked for him last year. I mean, he just he had a few different guys, but having Gronk there, man, is, is a real um, security blanket. Now, he has one of the more interesting looks to his to the contract. He has a contract that actually lists years 2021 20, through 2025. But 2022 through 2025, the base salary is void. So he's getting 1.75 mil in 2021. And he has bonus money for each one of those years, totaling 6.2 million. So they're just not on the hook for the salary. And consequently, uh, they've kept those uh, cap hits pretty low. His biggest cap hit would be next year at 5 million, 2.4% of, uh, uh, of the total cap space. So, you know, we'll see how that works out for next year. But for yeah. this year to be able to just hit, get hit for three million from Gronk and be able to, uh, you know, have that, that security blanket there for, for Brady, that's, that's pretty good. And we, we were pretty um, complimentary to the management team, the contract specialists uh, that the, the Buccaneers had. So, you yeah, know, the contract is, yeah. uh, is kind of creative. I'd have to really study it a little further. Because uh, those guys are PhDs in those contracts. I, I would venture, when you talk about bonuses, I would venture to guess that uh, his contract is pretty incentive laden. In other well, words, he has no base salary listed for 2022 through 2025. That's it's all bonus money. Well, it's all about his production. So basically, it's like, dude, if you can get over 500 yards again, you get this much. If you score five touchdowns or more, you get this much. You I don't even think it's good. that, Benny. I think he pretty much is just, they just gave him that money, like guaranteed nah. salary. Like here's nah. 6.2 million. Nah. And you know, we're going to, we're going to, uh, um, we're going to contract prorate it out over the next few years, but we're going to give you that money now. So we're only talking about 8 million total. It's not a lot of money. I don't think that it's really incentive laden. I think they pretty much gave it to him. He got paid and they're going to get what Gronk gives them. I don't know about that, but if you're going to study it, 
take a look and let me know. I, I believe a guy of his skill level, yet at the age that he is, is going to have some incentives baked in there. Okay, we shall see. So you think I, he has some incentives? I believe that's how you would handle a player like Gronk. I think they just Number gave one Gronk gets the money. <laughs> that's what I say. Yeah, to me, that's money, Gronk, because eight million is nothing. That's I mean, nothing. Eight million is starting running backs out here making eight million. Starting running backs making eight yeah, million. Yeah, but okay, that's not nothing. You know what they went through? To, you know what they went through to re-sign their entire team? That was no easy task, bro. Eight no, I'm, million, I'm not. I agree with you there. I agree with you. That eight million. He has to earn that eight million, and that's incentive for him. If you want to get the best out of Gronk, what better way to do it than say, Gronk, I know you can get over 400 yards receiving. Yeah, I can do that. All right, we'll give you 1.2 if you do. And if he doesn't, guess what? They plug and play O.J. Howard, and they don't worry about that money they lost. They can give it to somebody else. That's the smart thing to do. If they just tossed eight million at him for the hell of it because he's Gronk, I don't think that's smart, and I believe they're smarter than that. We shall see. We shall see. But uh, that might be one year's salary for a really good running back. Uh, he is Gronkowski, though, and he did help deliver a championship. So, you yeah, know, yeah, I, I, it's still, it, 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 was, it would have been a good investment one way or the other. But we'll find out if there's any incentives built into that. He has no I, I, cap I'm not hit. Saying they're, from, they're unattainable. I'm not saying they're unattainable. When you, if you find incentives, and I could be wrong, but if you do find some, I don't think they're going to be outlandish. I think he'll be able to hit them all if he stays healthy. But we're talking about a guy who's got a lot of years under his belt and a guy who has some, had some pretty bad injuries. That's, that's all I'm saying. I, all right. I, whatever they give him will be easily attainable for him. Which means that basically, yeah, they're just giving him the eight million. We know you can do that. We know you can do that. But the insurance policy is, is if he goes down, that's money they save. We shall see. All right. Moving on from Gronkowski, we have number eight, Mr. Mike Gesicki. Hey I Ben. Like Mike Gesicki. Hey Ben. Before yes. you go on. Quick trivia question. Go ahead. How many Gronkowskis are there in the NFL? Three. Close. I counted four. Four. Okay. But the one of them is kind of in limbo, isn't he? Well, he came up in, in the list when I was looking at the contracts. I saw four come up. Right, but is he actually is he actually in uh, on a contract on a team? I would have to say yes because he came up in the list of contracts, but I'm not going to, okay. you know, I'm not going to, I just thought it was, I didn't think anybody else was named Gronkowski in the NFL. Oh, absolutely. That's <laughs> how many Gronkowskis we got. You know, it's funny when you start to do How many does it take to screw in a light bulb or something? I didn't, <laughs> I didn't know where you were going with that. <laughs> well, it's interesting because um, as you, as I do research and I see certain things, certain names, for example, like if you put in certain names, you get long lists of players. So yeah. one of these days, I'm going to take a look and find out what is the most common name, first name or most common last name in the NFL. That should be an interesting trivia question. Maybe we'll do a special promotion for the people who can answer that question. Oh, <laughs> Lord. <laughs> but yeah. Let me move on, please. Let me move on. How many Gasekis are there How in the NFL? How many Gasekis does it take? We got Mike Gasekis. <laughs> I think he's the only one We might be making fun of his name, but this guy is ranked by Pro Football Focus as the number eight tight end, <clears throat> excuse me, in the NFL. He plays for the Miami Dolphins. Yes, the up and coming Miami Dolphins. Now, here's the thing about Kasiki that's really, really interesting. He's hardly ever used in the run game. Seldom do they line him up inside and then use him in the run game. They will line him up in line is what they call it or inside in the normal 
quote unquote normal tight end position, but he's running routes out of there. And he runs most of his routes out of the slot. So if you watch a Miami Dolphins game and you're looking for the slot receiver, a lot of times you're going to see number 88 out there running out of the slot. That's how good of a receiver this guy is. He got targeted 82 times last year. He caught 53 passes for 703 yards and six touchdowns. So here we are at number eight, and we are clearly seeing the yardage and the receptions and the touchdown numbers going up. Mike Gesicki is a really, really good tight end and could stay in the top 10 for a while. Just off his pass receiving prowess alone. All right. Well, then, if he's going to be um, doing that for a while, he's going to get paid because this is a contract year, Benny. He has not cost them a lot of money. His contract ran from 2018 to 2021, total $6.6 million against the cap. So he hasn't cost them a lot of money, but he's getting paid uh, about $2 million, a little over $2 million against the cap for 2021. But this is your contract year, so, you know, there's your – your hint for your um, fantasy football people out there. And he's a uh, Penn State kid. And he's a Penn State kid. Got uh, okay, Penn State in the house. All right, Benny, there you go. Now, wait, how many we got? Uh, how many left? We're up to number seven. Up to number seven, top seven. All right, who we got? Top seven. Number seven is TJ Hawkinson of the Detroit Lions. T.J. Hawkinson is another guy who isn't a great athlete, but he's big, he's strong, and he has really, really good hands. He grades out as an above-average run blocker and an above-average receiver, so he's solid at both. And he has the ability to be a top-10 tight end for years to come. Listen to these numbers. Targeted 96 times, caught 67 passes, 723 yards, and six touchdowns. Again, like I said earlier, if you can get four, five, six, or more touchdowns out of your tight end, you got yourself a tight end you want to hang on to. Whether he's a good run blocker or not, TJ Hawkinson is solid in both phases of the game. TJ Hawkinson belongs in the top 10. He's my number seven guy. TJ Hawkinson had a total contract of a little over 20 million. So he got paid pretty nicely. His contract runs out in 2022. Uh, he's putting on a uh, $5.5 million cap hit for this current year at age 24 and 6.5 million next year. Again, you have that escalating cap hit. That's the way they seem to like to do things. So, you know, he's gotten paid some nice money. Um, we shall see, you know, how this works out. But it's not exactly a contract year, but it's the, uh, a year when the, uh, the cap hit is starting to escalate. So we'll keep an eye on, on that gentleman right there, TJ Hawkinson. All right. How are we doing? We're doing great. We're at number six. And number six is Mark Andrews, another very familiar name, obviously. Mark Andrews of the Baltimore Ravens. Oh, boy. This guy's a big target who runs a great seam route. You watch Ravens games. Anytime that Lamar gets in trouble, he'll hit Mark Andrews down the seam for a big play. This guy moves the sticks. He can run. He can catch. And he's a big-time red zone threat. In fact, over the last two seasons, he's been a primary target for the run-centric Ravens because they really haven't had any big-name wide receivers. Up to last year, the, the biggest name wide receiver was Marquise Brown, who basically did have a really good season last year, but that was his first really good season. So it's funny, as good as the um, – <clears throat> excuse me, as good as Lamar Jackson is and as good as the Ravens are, that their primary or top – receiver was in fact a tight end is kind of crazy that's mark andrews that's what we're talking about he's had 12 touchdowns in the last two seasons 
That's tied with Travis Kelsey. Now, that might change this year because they did get some receivers in the draft that they're going to be uh, kind of leaning heavily on, guys that they picked sort of early that they're expecting to come in and help them out right away. So that might affect his numbers some. But last year, again, here we go with receiver numbers, 58 catches, 88 targets, 701 yards, and seven big touchdown catches. Mark Andrews is a beast. He deserves to be in the top 10. He sits at number six. Number six. Now, Ben, we've had a we've had tight ends with $50 million contract totals, $37 million contract totals. He he has a four-year contract. This is a contract year. Just for the fun of it, what would you say his total contract cap hit was for those four wow. years? Wow. I this this you might say for the fun of it, but it's not fun for me. But since you mentioned the other two guys that made so much money, I'm going to venture to guess, without guessing a number, that it's less than those two. Is that your guess? Just it's less. <laughs> it's going to be less than either of those other two guys that you mentioned. Well, you you are right on that level. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> without throwing out a number, no fun at all let's try six million total cap it wow four year period <laughs> this guy deserves a raise let me just say that you think so Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> this is his contract year so there's there's another one of your fantasy uh uh hints there for contract year there i think i think they should offer him an extension during camp forthrightly eh? yeah don't yes absolutely <laughs> Because if, if one of these rookies or one of these free agents that they bring in doesn't pan out, it's going to be Mark Andrews up the seam all day long. Marquise Brown is just beginning to go from a deep threat to an actual long ball pass receiver. You know what I mean? Before he was just running and then Mark Andrews would run behind him and catch all the balls. Well, now we need you to run and catch some bombs and score some touchdowns. And they brought in, uh, who's we see, they did Rashad Bateman, they got in the draft. They're expecting big things from this kid. And from what I'm hearing in OTAs, he really showed out. So, you know, the bottom line is you need Mark Andrews. He has worked well for you. If anybody deserves an extension, it's this guy. All right. We are in the top five. Top five, baby. Top five. Number five might be <laughs> number five might be a surprise for some folks, but number five is going is going to be a surprise for most folks. It's going to be a surprise for most folks. But if you've been listening, you probably say mm, they didn't say him yet. Dallas Goddard of the Philadelphia Eagles is the number five tight end as ranked by Pro Football Focus. Even while sharing the field with Zach Ertz, this guy has proven to be a threat as a receiver and is actually a really good run black blocker. He grades high in both aspects of the game. Last season, he caught 46 passes on 64 targets for 524 yards and three touchdowns. And as far as I'm concerned, if Ertz had been hurt to the extent where he couldn't play at all, Goddard's numbers would have been much, much better. Obviously, the Eagles are looking for him to be their number one guy for some years to come. We all believe that Ertz's, num uh, Ertz's time in Philadelphia, uh, those day his days are numbered. Um, even if he has a bounce back year, I think they're going to lean a lot more heavily on Goddard and just feed Ertz enough to get his drafts, uh, get his trade stock up and then be done with him because they believe that Goddard can carry the load. I agree with them. I'm not an Eagles fan, but I like Dallas Goddard. Dallas Goddard, Dallas Goddard is getting paid very much like Mark Andrews, 5.6 million against the cap. Uh, looks like a rookie contract 2018. This is his contract year 2021. So again, 
There's your fantasy alert. But uh, yeah, I mean, you know, about a million per year, you know, pushing up toward 2 million, uh, less than 1% of the cap hit. So they've been getting away good. And for a number five tight end, you know, man, that's, that's some good value right there. Yeah, that's, that's some excellent value for the Eagles. Uh, they're not in the same situation as the Ravens are with Andrews, where Andrews has been around for a while and they've been getting him on the cheap for a while and he's been producing for a while. You know, Goddard's kind of had to make his way up uh, working uh, with uh, Zach Ertz, but he's done enough now to show the Eagles that they don't really need Ertz anymore. He can handle the job. So another good season out of him, and that new contract should look pretty nice. Looks as if they came in at the same time, Benny, 2018. Oh, really? Yeah. I'm seeing contract year 2018 to 2021 for both of them. Okay, well, guess what? Uh, no, Andrews has been around longer than Goddard. But even if I'm wrong, Andrews was a factor from day one. That might be more of the situation Goddard, because yeah. you had Zach Ertz there earlier on. Right, right. And, and Andrews played with Hayden Hurst. But Andrews established himself as the main guy even when Hayden Hurst was still there. So, you know, yeah. Goddard, Goddard wasn't able to – to establish himself as quickly because Zach Ertz was still at the top of his game. Now, Benny, Goddard is number five. Number five is close to number four. Close. But then it's exactly not, <laughs> when you start to look at the talent, I don't think anybody that I've heard yet compare the talent of number four to number five, or maybe I should say the other way around. With all that being said, go ahead. Number four is? Number four is Kyle Pitts. <laughs> <laughs> the only rookie on here, the rookie tight end for the Atlanta Falcons. Let's remember, the Atlanta Falcons already have Hayden Hurst, and Hayden Hurst did make this list, okay? Hayden Hurst is a veteran tight end who made this list, albeit that he's lower, but he's on the list. And here comes Kyle Pitts, a rookie who has not played a down in the NFL, ranked at number four. This guy hasn't played a down yet, but his measurables are astounding. We're talking about a guy that's 6'6", 240 pounds, clocked an unofficial 444 at his pro day and has 33 and a half inch arms. <coughs> Look at me, I'm the, the, wing, the, wingspan, the wingspan over there is, is pretty ridiculous. And if you notice our picture is a lot smaller, um, it's because he's a rookie. He don't get a full size picture. Yeah, he doesn't get a full size picture. But guess what? I don't know that he's gonna earn this number four ranking, but I would venture to guess that come next year when we do these rankings, He'll, he will still be in the top 10, okay? I, I'm, I'm not going to throw all my eggs in a rookie's basket, but I think this guy has the true reachable potential to, to show that he is a, truly a top 10 tight end in the NFL. And there's no Julio Jones to compete for passes. Th this guy's going to be a factor right off the bat. Well, he has a four-year contract, total cap number of $32.9 million. Again, big salary discrepancy between five, six, and four. Yeah, but wasn't <laughs> They're making he about him? six. He's, good. He's making, uh, I guess, on average, about seven to ten. Okay, yeah, 5.9 in 2021, 10.4 uh, in 2024. So it ranges between those two. Yeah, you got to remember, this guy was the number four pick overall. Overall. Oh, he got paid as a number four yeah, pick. No Should tight end gets paid. It. Tight ends don't get picked in the first round, let alone the fourth pick overall. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, they got to get this guy money. Special. The gentleman is special, you know. The next gentleman up is special, too. He had a year last year. 
And uh, I wondered late in the season, did they not go to him enough? You know, I'm like, you know, you win games, you mean? Yeah, when you during the late, yeah, late in the season when they needed wins, I wondered if they were going, if they needed to go to him a little bit more. If the matchups were, to, there was nobody who could match up. If there was, if they were been able to, which I believe there was no reason for them not to, and they didn't, then that's a, a monumental uh, coaching error because we're talking about it number three. And before I even say his name, because most probably people, these top three are the part of pro football focus rankings that I totally 100% agree with. Oh, but, really? <laughs> but, but I'm not going to say that I totally agree with the order these three are in. Uh, all I'm going to say, and I'm going to leave it are to you. Gonna try to, you think you're going to inject Waller into someplace else in the top three? Is that I'm what you're going to I'm going to leave it to you to figure out what I mean by that when we're through with this, okay? But at number three, Pro Football Focus has Darren Waller of the Oakland, I'm sorry, the Las, <clears throat> excuse me, the Las Vegas Raiders at number three. Wow. Darren Waller. We just, I just gave the measurables for Kyle Pitts, 6'6", 240, okay? Darren Waller is 6'6", 255. Okay, and if he don't run a four four, he run a four five. Are you kidding me? Great hands, really good speed for a tight end. Nice size. I've seen him in the run game. He is not afraid to block. He, Darren Waller is what the Falcons hope Kyle Pitts can be. That's a quote from me. All right, that's not from anybody else. He has the ability to line up wide and be corners, okay? He can line up inside. You don't dare put a linebacker on him, okay? So you better bring a safety. He will destroy your safety. He will destroy your slot corner, and he will take your best court cover corner to task on the outside. That's how good this guy is. Listen to these numbers. 140 targets. And you just said they didn't use him enough. That's how good this dude is. 140 targets, 107 catches. There's teams with wide receivers they would kill that had production like that. 1,196 yards and nine touchdowns. Mm. Mm. Beast. beast. Yes, definitely a beast. Definitely a beast. What else you got? Anything, anything else on him? No, what you in a hurry to get to number two? No, but I didn't want to stop you because you were just going on and on. I mean, this gentleman's you know, speed, size, skill, hands, he's pretty good catch. You know, he, he doesn't drop much. Did, you, did he mention drops at all? No, I did not. Okay, Should I have no, I don't think so. I think he's got pretty good hands too. You yeah, know, like I said, I thought they could have went to him good. more. Um, looking at his contract 2019 to 2023. Uh, total thirty point seven million. I didn't know he got paid that. You know that they set him up that that much. Um, base salary ranges from four point five million back in 2019, 2021, where they're saying there's a triggering event. We have to find out what that all means. But he's getting six million this year, six million in 2022 and 2023. So he's got some bonus money, some workout bonuses, some other bonuses, and guaranteed money. In the, he got guaranteed money in 2019 to 2021. He's getting an extra $6 million. Uh, so his, his uh, <clears throat> total and guarantee for 2021 is $6 million. So this will be an interesting year for, for Darren Waller to be able to show that, uh, you know, he's the man. And uh, I think you're right. Now, you, you said you didn't know what order – and you said when you finish, no, I, didn't say that. I didn't say that. You didn't say, I don't know what order. You said you didn't agree with the order necessarily. I said, I agree with these three guys being in, in the top three, but I do not agree with the order that Pro Football Focus put them in. There's only three people we're talking about. So the order is, it's right here. Okay. 
But, oh, also, let me just say with Waller, I think they did something early on with his contract because I can remember when the Raiders were on hard knocks. It was his rookie year when they were on hard knocks. They didn't even realize what they had, but it didn't take them long to figure it out. And this is a guy who had substance abuse issues early on in life, really serious ones that he was able to beat. And now, I mean, I, he, he should be a he should be a Raider for life. I mean, you you don't let guys like this get away. But I digress. Number two, according to Pro Football Focus, is George Kittle of the San Francisco 49ers. Now of the what? Of the San Francisco 49ers. Okay. <laughs> you just you just had to hear me say it twice. My beloved. Go ahead. I, well, I wasn't going to say all that. Oh, I said it for you. Don't worry about it. I got okay, it. Okay. <laughs> George Kittle. Everybody knows George Kittle. Every fantasy player covets George Kittle. Okay. And even though he only played eight games last year because he had a broken foot, he still put up impressive numbers. Over the past three years, he has been the highest graded tight end in receiving and the third highest in run blocking. That's over the past three years. Number one receiving, number three run blocking. So when you talk about a guy that excels at both parts of the game for a tight end, there's your poster boy right there. Last season, in eight games, he was targeted 63 times. He caught 48 passes for 634 yards and two touchdowns. If you go back over this list, these numbers are right around or a little under or a little above almost every receiver from number, I'm off the top of my head, number 15 on down. Mm. And he did that in eight games. Wow. Yeah. 15 on down, he matched their production in eight games. Yes. Wow, that's an interesting um, relation, relational uh, statistic. Wow. Very interesting. Very interesting. George Kittle signed a nice big deal. He has a contract that runs here showing 2020 through 2025. Total cap number, 77.157 million. <laughs> Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Kittle? The that's dollars, is, we, we think that's confetti falling down. That must be money in different uh, international denominations. <laughs> raining down on you right there but that's my man no doubt about it and I think I have a hint as to what you were talking about relative to to that but for 2021 which is also one of those contract trigger years that we have to look into more deeply he's he's only hitting them up for five five point four five million which is less than three percent of the contract so um they're they're getting good value for 2021 from uh, Mr. Everything there, and uh, you know, hopefully he comes out and has a championship Super Bowl run type year, Mr. Kittle. Okay. <laughs> so here we are. Here we are at number one, and I'm sure anybody that's out there watching and listening knows who number one is going to be. But before I say his actual name, let me just point out that Pro Football Focus did say that if George Kittle had not sustained the injury that he had, we're looking at him and the number one guy, Travis Kelsey, as a 1A, 1B situation that could go either way. And the fact that he was hurt, I don't want to say by default, I don't want to say that, but that kind of put – Kelsey at number one. Now, I, hopefully that doesn't give away my thoughts as far as how the top three should go, but we're talking about Travis Kelsey of the Kansas City Chiefs. When you talk about Kansas City Chiefs, you have to talk about Travis Kelsey. Uh, we've mentioned some other tight ends that have been primary pass receivers for their teams, um, but they're ranked lower. 
this guy is a primary pass receiver for his team. And when I say primary, I, I should probably say main focus, okay? Because usually in the passing game, your wide receivers are your main focus. So when you have a tight end that's a main focus, that's a big deal. And that means that he's a really great player. This guy lives up um, – Oh, I'm sorry. This guy lines up in the, on the inside, okay, in line, like I was saying when I talked about uh, Gesicki not lining up inside. This guy lines up inside. He lines up in the slot. He lines up outside. He gets open on a regular basis. He's all over the field. Gets open on a regular basis against corners and against safeties, and most linebackers don't even have a chance against him. Now, I'm going to quote – pro football focus on this because I haven't done that yet. I've been using their information and putting my spin on it and giving my opinions. But on this, I'm going to quote them. Over the last five seasons, Kelsey's 2,639 yards after the catch are over 400 yards more than any other tight end or wide receiver in the entire NFL. Or wide receiver? 400 yards more than any other tight end or wide receiver in the league. Let, let that sink in a little bit. That's boss, man. That's His boss. middle name is Yak. <laughs> Travis Yak Kelsey. That's what I'm gonna call it. Every time I watch a Chiefs game, he catch a ball and be like, Yak! Yak. <laughs> Yo, 139 targets, 105 receptions, 1,416 yards, and 11, count them, 11 tutties. Wow. That's crazy, Ben. That's you crazy. And not argue. It's tough. It's tough. Well, you know, the contracts are kind of like 1A and 1B also. Okay. Because what Kittle total 77.157 million. Kelsey is 77.468. Wow. Wow. <laughs> So, you know, when they do their tight end university and they're out there having their little um, camp thing for other NFL tight ends, you've got two guys who are training you whose contracts total under over $154 million <laughs> for those two guys that are out there telling you how to plant your foot, <laughs> how to get off the line of scrimmage, and how to run after the catch more than likely, how to, how to get that extra two or three yards after the catch. Yeah. Because he does know how to kind of shrink his body and, and, and push forward, you know, and protect the ball. He does a good job of all of that kind of stuff. So, yeah, and you know, you know, it's funny you should bring up tight end university. I actually uh, uh, saw an article on that and uh, I was asking a question in my mind and this article kind of answered it. Um, and I, I realized what I didn't realize right away was that Kelsey and Kittle actually put this thing on together. Right. At first I thought it was just Kelsey, but they actually did it together. So here's two guys doing something like this for the brotherhood, so to speak. Okay. To help everybody improve their game, but they are probably not just by pro football focus, but every other outlet out there, one and two or one or two, uh, and all the rankings out there in, in some way, shape, or form. But it's just interesting. We've just completed this list. But listen to the names of the guys, some of the names of the guys that were at Tight End University. Darren Waller. <laughs> Noah Fant. Zach Ertz. Gosh. A, a veteran. Old veteran. Zach Ertz at Tight End University. Get being given by two young cats, Mark Andrews, Mike Gesicki, Cole Komet from the Chicago Bears, but is a pretty good player, Johnu Smith, Eric Ebron. Eric Ebron, hopefully, hopefully they had at least one day of seminar on how to hold on to the ball. TJ Hawkinson, David Njoku. Njoku. <laughs> yeah. This is big. 
if the dude makes a comeback, I mean, who's he got to beat out? Austin Hooper? Dorothy he doesn't Blake. want to be a bust. This is his chance. And he's starting off well by going to tight end university. Robert Tunyon, Kyle Pitts, a rookie showed up. Ethan Wolf, OJ Howard, Evan Ingram, Hunter Henry. They're all there, bro. So this is serious business with these tight ends. I love the tight end position. I love to watch these guys play. And I really appreciate what they bring to the table as far as offense is concerned. So this was really a really fun list for me to have to work on. I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, enlightening, man. Um, first of all, you know, tight ends, again, uh, those are guys who bridge the passing game and the run game. Um, and you said that I would have to guess the sequence. Yeah, or, but even if you guess, I'm not going to tell you. Oh, you're not going to tell me? No, I'm not going to tell you, so don't, you don't have to. Well, I'm going to tell you anyway. I think you're going Waller, Kelsey, two, and Kittles, one. That's the only difference. Oh, you think I'm switching Kelsey and Kittle? Yeah, yeah. You're making Kittle number one. Yeah, that's the sequence that I think you well, went. No, I like George Kittle, so I can understand you thinking that. And you probably also went on my thing about his numbers, even though he was injured. But mm -hmm. I'm not going to I'm not going to agree or disagree with your assessment while we are on the air. OK. All right. Well, ladies and germs, send in your comments and let us know what you think right. Ben's right. final three sequence would be. And then maybe we'll put it in comments uh, once we promote, once we put this video out on YouTube. Um, we're actually recording out of our normal time frame. So it, I really have to apologize for the calls and the things of that nature. I got a new phone, so I'm thinking I'm turning stuff down and it's probably, and it's not obviously not being turned down, but in yeah. any event, um, you know, we're doing this on a Thursday when we normally do this on a Wednesday and we had that time set aside. So long story short, Benny, 32 tight ends listed. We looked at their rankings on Pro Football Focus. We looked at your comments on, you know, how they're doing and what they're expecting to do. We found out some hints for fantasy football when you got to figure out who to take. Where do you go? Is this a contract year or not? That's something that, you know, hey, I'm learning every day. Um, and then finally, taking a look at some of the sizes and the differences in those contracts for these different um, uh, tight ends that are coming out. So I thought this was fantastic. I truly enjoyed it. Any last words on the tight ends? Last words on the tight ends? Uh, no, not really. I kind of, I think I kind of let people know how I felt about certain guys and what I expect from them. Um, usually uh, the, the teams that sign a guy on a, in free agency, they do it for a reason. Number one, well, part of it's money, part of it's skill, and part of it is how they feel he's going to fit in their offense. So that's something to look forward to. Uh, look, look, look forward to as far as teams like the um, the Patriots are concerned, or as far as um, the Buccaneers are concerned. You know what I mean? We have to wait and see how these things play out. The, the Ertz and Goddard thing is going to be interesting to watch. You know, that's that's about it. Watch these camp battles. Well, that's going to be fun to watch. We have some things to focus in on now with the tight ends. Uh, we'll be signing off from our radio audience at WJRL953.com. We'll be there with you every Friday from 6 to 7.30. And I just want to say thank you and remind you to visit www.Ben and Barry on football. All right, Benny, we're going to wrap this thing up with comments, concerns, mentions, things of that nature. Uh, I want to just, I want to throw this out just for some quick responses from you and we can see where we go. And then I want to mention something uh, relative to COVID. So, Simone Biles, just off the top of your head as a competitor, 
you know, and you look across different sports and how things are different, but how did you feel about her withdrawal from the Olympics? I mean, it was sad to see. Uh, I was looking forward to her coming in there and just destroying the field and guaranteeing gold for uh, the United States. Uh, even more than that, uh, I wanted to see her get the gold in the in the uh, individual events, as many as she could in the all around. Um, it's obvious to everybody out there that she's the best gymnast in the world. She's already proven that. But on this particular stage, at this particular time, um, some forces worked against her. I don't know what they were. It was not physical in my estimation, nor did she say that it was physical. She's claiming that it's all mental. So who am I to say anything about anybody else's mental state? I don't, I don't think that would be right. I hated to see it. I would have hoped that she could fight through it. She's chosen not to for whatever reason. And I don't think she owes me any explanation. That's just me. You know what I mean? The team itself was pretty good. Her being on it, again, like I said, pretty much guaranteed gold for the team. But guess what? They got silver without her. And her thought process was, if my head's not in it, I will actually get low scores, which will drag the rest of the team down. And the rest of the team was competing at a pretty high level on their own without her. So in actuality, it was better for her to drop out team-wise because they were able to get the silver on their own without her. You know what I mean? So in, in that respect, I think it was a good move um, as opposed to being selfish and trying to stay in there you know, and work her way through it, I think would have been selfish. Nobody knows an athlete's body better than that particular athlete. And we've been talking about athletes listening to their bodies. Uh, it's a funny thing. Men are kind of different. So men need doctors and trainers and other people to kind of protect them from themselves. Females are a little different, and I think they're more astute at listening to their bodies and, and understanding, you know, when things aren't right, okay? So I, I'm going to give her credit for what she's done. I'm not giving her credit because I think it was a great thing. I think it, for her, it was a necessary thing, and I applaud her for having the guts to, to go through it because some people would have just stayed out there and, and failed, and then everybody would trash them, you know, and they would hurt the teams. She didn't do that. It's Very all interesting um, situation. I did, you know, question, and, and I don't mean um, critically question, but just in my mind wonder, because I remember her saying something that kind of related to mental health prior to the Olympics. And I wondered if she was having some issues back then, which meant I wonder if there was some help that was sought prior to the Olympics or should have been so that, you know, um, that head situation could have been taken care of. I watched the sequence of her performances and some of the prelims where her landings and stuff were really- Yes, yes. I told Desiree, the very, my daughter Desiree, who loves Simone Biles. The very first night I said, D, something's not right. Yeah, yeah, because she normally right. she, she sticks those landings and stuff. Yes. Routinely. And, you know, even thinking about it, as they said, when you're doing the stuff that she does, it's not like if you're running 100 and you wonder if your head's there. If you're running 100 and your head's not in it, you might come in last. If right. you do one of those things that she does where you're spinning in the air and turning and twisting and your head's not right, you could completely hurt yourself or kill yourself. So the exactly. consequences of not having your head right, you know, it's different than Ben Simmons. His head ain't right. He can't shoot a jump shot. It's a little bit different. You know, he's off to the, um, you know, wherever for vacation, he's fine. He is not going to hurt himself, but she could truly have hurt herself. So, you know, that was that was one of the things. But I also got the feeling that 
some of our athletes who are at the top of their game have a little more, we use the word cachet when we were talking about Aaron Rodgers and, you know, things he won and then can you get it in terms of being able to say, okay, my head's not here and there's some, some problem and I'm just going to step out because they were showing a number of other athletes who in time, some of them came back and in supporting her said, I wish I had have had that level of courage or whatever, because my head wasn't, or my was actually physically injured and I can continue to compete. But those people didn't have the level of accomplishments of a, a Naomi Osaka or a Simone Biles who can then say, nah, this ain't right. You know, I'm not going to do it. Um, but they're at the top of their game. They're at the top. So it kind of gives them, I think a little more, you know, maybe it's leadership, you know, that they can show because they are, they are at the top. But I also think that the pressure for them to be able to say, hey, I'm going to leave this alone today is not the same as when you're hungry and you're just trying to, you know, you're trying to get that first medal. You can so. also look at it like this, though. And I, I agree with what you're saying. But you can also look at it like this. Part of the reason they are where they are is because they've been able to handle more mental stress than a lot of others. They've already pushed through stuff yeah. that the others can't push through, therefore can't reach their level, you know what I mean, competitively. Which and makes now, it that much harder to understand that now that you're at that pinnacle, I you know, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, Wusa wouldn't have just did it for you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Stella. Right, yeah, but it's but but mm. who knows what all they went through yeah. and and were able to surpass that other people hit the wall at. It's not just that she's better than you. It's more to it than that. You know what I mean? Part, part of being better than you is she was able to overcome some difficulties that you weren't able to overcome. That's why she's better than you. And right. now that she's there, you know, her stress might be far worse than your stress. So, yeah. well, you know, the environment there in Japan is also really strange. Um, yes, that's part of it, too. Which, and there's, a, there's something else, too. What's that? I'm not 100% sure about this. Maybe you can answer this question for me. Is it true that they told her she had to eliminate some particular move that she does because it was so difficult that nobody else was able to do it or had a chance at it? Did you hear that? I've heard that. I, I heard that. I think that's freaking ridiculous. I think that's... I think that's atrocious. That's a travesty. That's that's horrible. Well, and it's, you know, what can I tell you? Um, I need to have that confirmed, but I have seen that all over social media. So if that's true, I think that's awful. That that would be an awful thing if that's true. Um, you know, you gotta, but. I also think I heard that their reasoning had something to do with not wanting other athletes to try to imitate Riot that. Because they'll hurt themselves. Because they'll hurt themselves. It was too dangerous for the Olympics. Stop yeah. it. Stop. <laughs> if she can do it, that means it's humanly possible. So at that point, it becomes up to you whether or not you want to try it. <laughs> kind of like That's telling me. So to kind of like telling the runner who broke the four minute mile, no, don't go that fast. The yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, it's too fast. Uh, you know, something might have, your head might explode. Oh man. <laughs> All right, moving on real quick. Um, I saw the Aaron Rodgers interview, and it was interesting how much the reporting was pretty much saying what he said even though he never actually said it you know and then he came in and talked about what he wanted from the organization and he said a lot bro and how he thought it, they he wasn't he wasn't happy with the way they let other people go and he kind of felt they were disrespect and he went all the way back right the, the bottom line is you want to talk about cachet, a guy at the top of his game having the cachet to say certain things that other people won't say or feel like they can't say or shouldn't say. Okay, fine. Here he is. But guess what? 
he's the reigning defending MVP. So yeah, he's got that cachet. And he didn't have to say all the things that he said. He pretty much pulled the covers off at everything, bro. You never hear a player dole out information between himself and the team like he did. <laughs> that was crazy. And it wasn't in a mean or nasty way. He just said, with all the speculation and all the he said, she said that was out there that comes with re sports reporting and comes with social media, I'm going to take y'all back so you can follow your timelines and I'm going to tell you what really happened. When everybody thought this was going on, this is what was going on. When everybody said, when I said this, this is why I said it. When they made me this offer, this is what I told them. And he went right down. To the, so now there's no question about what happened and how he stands. And then when the GM, and when it is his turn to talk, he didn't rebut a utterance, nothing. There was nothing he could say. They're on the hook. And he warned them. And, and, and again, all he really asked for, and I know this is a small part of it, but all he really asked for, and he repeated this during his, his conference, was a say in the future of this team. Players don't come to Green Bay, Wisconsin on vacation. They go to Green Bay, Wisconsin because of me. He could have ended it right there for me. Drop the mic, dog. That's that's facts. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Charles Woodson was why who I couldn't remember. Yes. How they do you all you back to that? <laughs> they didn't go to the Raiders. Come on, dog. Uh, me. Well, you know, and, and it's interesting because you know there that puts out questions about loyalty and and that type of stuff and and respect, and I think again. One of the things that I noticed or that's unique about Green Bay is their corporate structure compared to every other team. And I kind of always feel like that corporate structure can get bureaucratic. That's when it can seem kind of cold and, un, you know, and unfeeling. And so he was, he's kind of like a, a, an American worker dealing with the man, dealing with that corporate yeah. structure, you know, yep. You, yep. you got, even companies like Google or, or Microsoft or big companies, you know, that treat their employees great, but you have some employees that are saying, hey, you guys, you know, some of the things you're doing, we have to protest, you know, and right. you've said against corporations. So that's interesting there. All right. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, our girl, Miss Plummer, Janine Plummer from the World, uh, the Women's Football Alliance. And we, we did say last week, um, congratulations on winning that uh, Division II championship. We're going to have to bone up on our World uh, Women's Football Alliance uh, information to know what the difference between uh, the, the Division I, II, and three is. But it looks like you're moving up uh, when you're going from three to two to one. We'll find out a little bit more than that. So again, congratulations to her. Um, I'll finish up my statement with this. I use um, the sports organizations as sort of a canary in the coal mine for what's going on, excuse me, canary in the coal mine for what's going on with COVID uh, because that's where you have the most intense testing. I've always been a proponent of testing because before we had the vaccines and before we even knew whether there were any therapeutics and all of that stuff is, you know, new to some degree. Um, that was the only way to kind of, you know, protect yourself, you know, was to get a test and to know who got, who needed to be isolated because they were positive or maybe who needed to be quarantined. Um, everybody that's healthy is quarantined when you have a pandemic. That was kind of what happened. That's why we all stayed home. But, um, by knowing through testing, you could actually sort of control what's going on. So when I see the number of infections that the Olympics had, when I see the number of infections that have popped up in uh, baseball, <laughs> and we just, who was it? Um, Lamar, Lamar Jackson, 
just showed up positive again. He can't figure out how that happened. These are professionals who should be basically quarantining themselves during this pandemic, you know, and, and are still coming down. So it, it makes me really um, cautious relative to what's going on in the general population that does not get tested on a, on, a, on a basis. One of the companies that did test it, their stock just dropped because nobody was getting tested, you know, not in the general population. Their business was, was, was going down the tubes. So mm-hmm. long story short, um, my level of concern has actually risen. And then as I see what's going on in the hospitals and then across the country as the Delta variant, and now they've got some new variants that are starting to pop up, uh, has shown to be not only uh, more contagious, but potentially more deadly, you know. And easier to contract. That's the contagious part, absolutely. And then, oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, now, <laughs> and now they have a new term called breakthrough infections, where now they're saying, oh, okay, well, even if you're vaccinated now, we're saying that you can still A, get infected, and B, be contagious. I've been saying that all along, you know, and that even though you're asymptomatic. I've been reading that too. Yeah, yeah. yeah the whole, so, that, that's, that was suspected, I think, from the jump and kind of has made itself uh, pretty known now that even if you're vaccinated, you can still contract the disease and you can still be contagious, although you may be asymptomatic. And, and the time that you stay um infected may be less but it still doesn't stop you from catching it and or carrying it and or passing it on to someone else especially someone else who may not be vaccinated so yeah yeah absolutely and then for those people who have some issue with the vaccinations and are not vaccinated you know a lot of that is going on. So you've got a certain percentage of the country that's just, you know, resisting that whole move. So um, that means that we do not reach what they call herd immunity, which is where the point where so many people are immune that the virus begins to sort of go away. It can't continue to replicate and it doesn't vary as much when you reach um, herd immunity. So that's right now while we're still seeing more variants, as long as it can continue to do it, that's what they do. It's what a virus does. You know, right. so I just want to put that out there for everybody to, you know, keep your guard up. Remember, this is a race. The, the Spanish flu was a two to three year event. It was not a six month or, you know, a one year right. event. That's right. And, you know, this is a whole nother level of, uh, of disease. So just you know, keep your guard up, you know, um, if you're traveling, you know, you travel very successfully, you've been able to travel and um, avoid infections because you test, you know, so you kind of know what your status is. And so it can be done, but you have to do it very carefully. So yeah, well, you know, the thing about travel is what people don't think about is when you're traveling, number one, you're going to be if you're going to be around people, They are people you don't know and you don't know where they're from. So you might say, oh, yeah, we're going to a tournament in Virginia. I'll just say you can drive there and you might look at Virginia's numbers and say, oh, Virginia's doing really well. The numbers are down and all that. Okay, but suppose you come across some people that are traveling cross country or coming up from Alabama or, you know, I mean, you stop at a rest stop. You walk in, no mask, get something to eat. That's where they get you, or that's where it gets you, you know? So you always have to be aware. When I'm going to be around people that I don't know, I'm wearing a mask. I don't care if they got one on or not. When I go in a store, I put on a mask because I don't know you and I don't know where you're from. I don't know who you've been around. When I'm in the house or I'm around people that I know, uh, you know, I'm going to be a little bit more lenient, probably a little bit more lenient than you would be, (laughs) <laughs> well, I have an unvaccinated I'm surprised you don't have a real canary in your house <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know yeah. Um, and, and, and it's so true what you said I actually saw a news article this morning 
uh, a young lady or a lady with her 17 year old son. And she said that they decided to go into a fast restaurant, a fast food restaurant and eat. And she said, I should not have done that. He was not vaccinated. She was, he is now in the hospital on all types of ventilation. I don't think he has actual ventilator, but he has oxygen and things of that nature. And, you know, he looks like he'll come through, but he was uh, overweight and that's, you know, a problem. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of those things. And so he was really suffering. And so, yeah, it could be something just that simple. All right. This is what people are forgetting. Let me, let me say this real fast. I know we talked about this a long time. Let me say, this is what's, what's, what's this thing has developed into and these variants and stuff have done. Early on, they were saying, well, yeah, young people can get it, but, you know, their immune system and they're young and all, they can usually fight it off. They might be asymptomatic or even if they get symptoms. They can usually fight it off over time, blah, blah, blah. Older folks, uh, not so much. These are the people that are most likely to get really, really sick, have to be hospitalized and possibly die. Now it's almost the opposite. Now the vaccinations have come around. The older people are getting the vaccinations because let's face it, the main objective of the vaccination is if you catch it, that you don't die, that you don't get deathly ill. So the older people who already been through that and have seen that, are now getting the vaccination. Now they seem to be okay. They're the ones who may be asymptomatic and have it and could possibly pass it, but are not getting sick. And the young people now are getting hit with a variant that's worse than the original. And now they're getting sick. It's crazy, man. It, it doesn't make sense to me. You don't want to get the vaccination and you didn't want to wear a mask. Start over from the beginning and start wearing the mask now. I am. Uh... I literally have a video on my personal page from Bill Nye, the science guy, talking about the science of masks. There you um, go. And one thing I will mention also, and I've said to people, I don't think people really appreciate the potential of exponential growth. Uh, and my other uh, things that I do relative to finance, we talk about compound growth, exponential growth all the time. You want that in your investments, you know, if you can get it. But, but when you you're looking at viruses, you don't want to which your vi when a virus is doubling every week or every month, it, it, it might seem like an insig num insignificant number today, but very quickly it can grow to a number that surpasses the medical community's ability to manage these caseloads. That's what happened in. And the first one, when we got caught off guard and then the military had to come in and build military hospitals, you know, China built a hospital in like a week or something yeah, like yeah. that because yeah. they had so many cases that overwhelmed. So a lot of times the medical community, when you when they're showing their concern, it's because they understand their capacity. And if, you know, things go from a, a hundred to 200, that's one thing. But once they get to a thousand and they're still doubling and they go from a thousand to two thousand, two thousand to four, four to eight, now yeah. all of a sudden limits are starting to be breached. And that's where you begin to have some real issues. And that's what you want to avoid. So all of those precautions, vaccinations, masks, isolation, you know, quarantine, all of those types of things, just give them serious consideration, live your life, try to enjoy yourself, but just be careful because at this particular point, it's not over. And that's just the main point that I wanted to make. It's not over. All right. Floor is yours, Mr. Dickerson. Any- I won't need the floor real long. I won't need it real long. Cause you know what I'm gonna say? I'm gonna say go Knowles. <laughs> Bam. 